Scars for most men are a rite of passage. We love to show you our scars. Now that doesn't mean that women don't like to show you their scars as well, but for men it's like a badge of honor. How many of you have scars like that you could show that you could show, right? That's different. But it's it's kind of like this badge of honor. We use them to show how strong we are, even though we wouldn't say that. That's what we're really doing. We're saying, look what I've been through. Look what I've dealt with. Look at the kinds of things that I've been through, and I'm still here before you today. I remember one morning when Truett was younger, we went out and we were going to buy chickens when we had chickens, and he was playing on a playground, and it was metal, and it had just been kind of dewy out the night before, and he's just being a kid, and he's running, and he's jumping, and he slipped and fell, and he hit his eye, and I mean, he was bleeding everywhere. And you know, as a parent, that's always scary. And we went, and they didn't even stitch him up. They just put some glue on it and glued it back together, and I said I could have done that at home. But it was, it was an amazing thing. And if you're a parent, you know if you have more than one child when they're playing together and you hear a thump, you know the severity of what is going on by how many children come running to you. Like if it's just the one child that comes to you, you know it's probably not as bad. But if both children come running to you before you yell for them, then you have an idea that it's pretty bad. In our household, Josiah is normally the one that hurts everyone else, or at least he puts them up to doing something to get hurt, because that's what the oldest normally does. And you'll hear a thump, and here they both come. Mom, I promise, all I did was, I just barely hit him. And our most recent event also involves Truett. Our boys were wrestling on the bed, and they were being like boys do. And for some reason, the two older boys forgot to remind Malachi that they had quit wrestling. And he drop kicked Truett off the bed. And it broke his arm. But scars are, are they tell a story. And the truth is, is that some of us We have scars that are more than just physical. Some of us have emotional scars. Some of us have scars from things in our past that have just cut us deeply. We have the scar of divorce. Or you have the scar of of a loved one that has died way too soon from cancer. Or you hold the scar of a job loss. But scars are often more times than not more than just physical. And we've been looking at this scripture from 2 Timothy 11 and on, or 2 Timothy, the first chapter, starting in verse 11 and on. I just want to read you two verses about Paul here as he begins to talk about his scars. He says this, And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet, I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him for that day. So what he's doing in these verses is he's beginning to talk about his scars. And what I really think he's doing here is he introduces you to this idea of this and that. And he says, of this gospel of this truth that I believe, of this thing that I hold on to. And he's talking about that thing that he's suffering. That idea, that pain that he's going through, that that loss that he has had. 
And this isn't the first time that Paul has talked about his sufferings. This isn't the first time that Paul has talked about his scars. In fact, 10 years earlier, he began to talk about his scars with some really righteous and, and holy people. See, these people didn't believe that Paul could possibly be a saved man. They didn't believe that Paul could possibly be called by Jesus because they knew the things that he had been through. And here he is, and he's trying to make them aware that he is called. So in 2 Corinthians 11, in verses 21 and 22, it says this. It says, hold on, it says, are they Hebrews? And he's talking about these people that have been coming against him. He says, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they, are they servants of Christ? And he says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. He said, I'm more of a servant of Christ. He says, I've, been, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. See, because to these righteous people, that he's talking to, that he's talking about, <clears throat> even though our scars may be a rite of passage, to these people, his scars and the things that he's been through mean that there is no God that he is serving. If there's a greater God, how could he possibly have went through all of these things? How could he possibly have all the scars that he does if he serves a greater God? And Paul is talking to these people, and his whole idea and what he's trying to get to is he's trying to say, listen, guys, what you need to realize is that just because you have scars, just because you've been through things, it doesn't mean that you're not called. Just because you have scars, just because you've been through things, it doesn't mean that there isn't a God that protects you. In fact, the thing that Paul is about to argue is the exact opposite. Paul is about to argue this idea that the fact that he has these scars actually means that he is called. And the thing that he's really about to get down to, basically what he is telling us, is that God is a scar shaper. What he's trying to tell us is that God is a scar shaper. And let me read to you as he really gets deep into what he's been through in verses 24 through 31. It says this, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. This sounds insane. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from false believers. He's just going on and on. He's saying, look at all these scars I have. Look at everything that I've been through. And he goes on, he says, I've labored and toiled and have gone, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure from, of my concern for all the churches. Listen, this man was a pastor and he didn't just care about his church. He cared about every church that he had started. And he's saying, not only am I going through all these things I've already talked to you about, all these horrible things, but I also feel the pressure of leading all these churches, of leading all these people back to Jesus, of leading them in the right direction. And he keeps going. He said, who is weak? And I do not feel weak who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. See, these people, they said, Paul, buddy,
So they're saying, Paul, buddy, you could not possibly be serving this God that you talk about. There's no way. Because this God that you talk about, you talk about how good he is. You talk about how he'll save us from everything. You talk about how we can leave what we know and we can come follow this new way. Paul, there's no way that your way is better. And Paul is arguing, he's saying, look at everything that I've been through. Look at everything that I've dealt with. And I couldn't even imagine half of the things that Paul endured. See, we have things go wrong in our life, and we're like, man, this is the worst day ever. And Paul begins to talk about all he's been through, and he says, listen, I know in whom I believe. The problem is, is in our society, we start to look at this gospel through the lens of that which we're going through. We look at this gospel through the lens of that that is going on in our lives. And we see all these problems and we see us, for instance, you lose your job and all of a sudden you look at this and you say, God, where are you? God, you promised that you would take care of me. God, you promised that you would protect me. Where are you? Or maybe we, someone we really love gets cancer and we say, God, I've read this book and I know that you are good. I've read this book and I know that you can heal anyone. So where are you now? And this is the same idea that these people had with Paul. They said, Paul, there is no way this God of yours could be any good. Look at all the things in your life. Look at all that you've gone through. Look at all of this stuff. Paul, there's no way. And what Paul is telling us is we've got our lenses wrong. Instead of looking at this, through what is going on in our lives, what Paul is telling us is we should look at that through the lens of this. And that is a totally different concept. Paul is saying, if all these things that are going on in your life and you see it and you realize that God is still in control, it changes everything. Paul said, there's never a time when I've doubted the goodness of God. There's never a time when I looked at the situations in my life and I said, what is wrong with God? In fact, Paul would say, I realize that God can use everything that's ever happened. I realize that God can shape every scar in my life. For his good. I realize that God can shape every scar, every moment of my life for something that glorifies him. And what you need to realize is that God can do the same thing in your life. God can use every scar in your life For his good. Those things that you think back on in your life and the very thing that you wish that you could change because it hurts so deeply. Paul would tell you, listen, God can use that for his good. God can turn that around and he could use it for his good. And some people get this idea that when we talk about how God is the scar shaper and God can use every scar, some of us start to get this idea that maybe 
That means that all scars come from God. I don't believe that's true. I think that some of our scars come from our own stupidity. We make stupid decisions. We do things that glorify us, that aren't in line with the will of God. I know people that have gotten a DUI and they blamed it on the devil. And I'm like, that was your decision. But not all scars come from God. But he can shape them into anything that he wants to. I had a man that I used to work with at Dairy Queen many, many years ago. And he believed that there were scar shapers. Except he believed that he had been abducted by aliens. This is not a joke. Because if you looked at his arm, there were three moles on his arm that made a perfect triangle. He had measured it. And that's just not natural. So he had this whole lot story of how he had been abducted by aliens. He believed it. He believed that there were scar shapers, but he didn't believe in God. And what I want you to know this morning is that God can use everything that's ever happened to you for his benefit. God can use everything that has ever happened to you to glorify him. And the beauty of that is, is he can even use those scars that were from your own stupidity. He can take that and he can use it for his own good. Not only when we show off our scars are we trying to show people what we've been through, but we're also telling them what not to do sometimes. You probably shouldn't try this. And when we talk about our emotional scars and the things that we've been through, sometimes we're telling people, hey man, you might want to steer clear of this substance, or you might want to steer clear of this idea, or you might want to stay away from this altogether. Because God can use every scar to glorify himself. What Paul would tell us is that suffering for Christ is a blessing. That when we suffer for Jesus, that is a blessing. And here is probably the hardest thing for us to wrap our minds around. Not only does God shape our scars, but he also leads our path. In Psalm 37, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And for some of us, this is a really hard idea for us to wrap our head around. Because sometimes what that means, and even if you were to use Paul's life, for instance, sometimes what that means is God is going to live, deliver us and lead us out into the middle of a boat, out into the middle of a storm. And he's going to lead us to the places where we might get scarred. And we say, I don't like that idea. Why would God do that? Why would he lead me to a place where I would get this scar? Because listen, sometimes the only way that we can look up and really depend on God is when he is the only thing that we can hold on to. When he's all that's left. Because otherwise we start to have this idea that we have some type of power. That we have some type of control. And what he would tell us is we have to depend on him for everything. And if the worship team would come this morning. The 
Some of you have had these scars in your life that have been haunting you. Much like earlier when I asked if you had scars that you could show, some of you have these emotional scars in your life that you've been covering up and you've been hiding for years. Not only do you not want people to know because it's embarrassing, but it just hurts way too much to talk about and to share. And what you need to know this morning and what you need to realize is that, that God can use that. Not only for your good, but God can use that for, for his good. He can use that to help other people. He can use what you've been through to help somebody else that might be going through the exact same thing. And what I think you will find is the pain that you feel when you start to share and you start to lead other people through the things that you've been through, some of that pain will become easier. And the burden will begin to be lifted because we are made to do life together. You and I weren't created to do life alone. That's why he tells us in James 5, 16, Therefore, come together and tell your sins to one another so that you might be healed. Sometimes the very thing that we need for God to be able to shape our scars is to come together with another believer and explain to them what we're dealing with. Will you stand with me this morning? Here in a moment, the guys and gals are going to play and they're going to sing and we're going to give you an opportunity to come. And maybe you have never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you have never declared him as your personal Lord and Savior. And this morning, we want to give you the opportunity to do that, to come and turn your life over to him and be baptized here this morning. And not only that, maybe you're holding on to a deep scar. And you just need someone to pray with you. And we'll have our prayer team up here to pray with you this morning. Because God can use everything that's ever happened in your life to glorify him and to help others. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you give us. Lord, I thank you this morning that no matter what I've been through, Lord, that you can use that to glorify you. Father, I thank you that you can use my scars for good, that they don't just have to be something that, that, that wails up on me, Lord, that piles up, that weighs me down, Lord, but you can use it for your good. Jesus, this morning we are just so thankful. I pray for those that are with us this morning that have been holding on to this pain and the scars for, for far too long. But I pray that this would be the morning that they would give it up to you, Lord. They would allow you to shape that for your good. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.